Hello and welcome. I am C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President and currently President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on Health. This is a very personal and important conversation that we will be engaging in today. And this work offers us an opportunity to further the mission of our organization through advocacy and empowerment. In our work, we focus on eight areas of health disparities directly and disproportionately impacting Black populations. They include HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, sickle cell, diabetes, and mental health. And today on our show, we'll discuss heart disease, cardiovascular diseases during COVID-19. We are still in very, very challenging and difficult times with respect to this pandemic. People are dying, people are fearful, people are looking for information, people are angry. And as we see the pandemic move, continue to move forward, we also face the course with social unrest, calling for social justice in all of the areas of our lives, including that of healthcare. So to discuss cardiovascular disease in light of everything that's happening with COVID, I am delighted to have an expert, mm -hmm. a guest, a friend, a civic and community partner, we are parts of important organizations that's continuing in work. Our sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, our Lynx Association, where work is being done throughout this country, through our organizations, as well as through our professional associations. So to have Dr. Asima B. Fergus here with us, who is a a sought after person around the country, and especially now more than ever, because of her expertise and her compassion and commitment to educating and supporting our community. Let me just say a few words about our guest. Dr. Fergus was recently appointed director of cardiovascular disparities at Mount Sinai Medical Center. And prior to this appointment, she served as chief of the Division of Cardiology at Columbia University Harlem Hospital Center, beginning in April 2007, and director of non-invasive cardiology of New York uh, Hospital Queens between 1999 to 2006. Her current academic appointment is Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. She's a Barnard and SUNY Downstate graduate, completed her residency at Albert Einstein Medical Center, and Dr. Fergus completed her cardiology fellowship at Well Cornell Medical Center. All these allergies and <laughs> degrees are amazing. <laughs> well deserved, of course. And she is board certified in internal medicine and cardiology. And I would say she is the author of a number of articles. And before we end, we will direct you to her website, 
where you can find out much more about this phenomenal woman. So Dr. Fergus, first of all, let me say welcome to you and thank you for joining us at this critical time for these discussions. So there's a lot to talk about and I'm gonna leave it up to you to talk as much as you want to about them. <laughs> but first of all, I'd like you to just sort of explain uh, something to our viewers about what you do uh, your the work as a major uh, cardiologist, and then we're going to talk some about COVID and its impact with respect to uh, CV, cardiovascular disease. Dr. Fergus, thank you so much. Sure. So, sore or C. Virginia, <laughs> Link sister, it's such a great pleasure and honor to be here with you this afternoon uh, to talk about such important topics. Uh, you know, I love the work that I do. Uh, it's emotional, it's gratifying, uh, and it's humbling because, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, um, you know, disease conditions or uh, risk factors that lead to these conditions, uh, you know, some of it is preventable, but, you know, basically you could say at times it's almost people's lives depend on what you're saying to them and how they receive it and how they move forward. So I'm always humbled, you know, by each um, interaction that I have, you know, with each individual person or patient. And I don't look at people. I think one of the reasons that I have such a wonderful working relationship with my patients, I don't look at them as a patient, but as a person, because even though, you know, we have these clinical trials, et cetera, that say, do this, this, and this. Each person is an individual. So you have to take that all into, a con into context. So you ask, what do I do? This is my approach as I approach um, individuals, not just with cardiovascular disease, but some of the chronic conditions that you even mentioned before that are, you know, lead up to heart disease, such as diabetes, hypertension, um, also, you know, cholesterol, physical inactivity, issues with weight and nutrition, which we see a lot in uh, communities of color. Um, I tend to focus on uh, individuals who are at very high risk or in high risk communities, but I also do a lot of prevention because heart disease is 80% preventable. So I do a lot of teaching within communities. I do medical missions and I actually, as, I, as you mentioned, I'm associate professor. So I actually, um, I mentor quite a few um, in young individuals um, in the field, trying to move forward, but also, you know, trying to get um, more kids of color to go into fields of STEAM and STEM. Okay, great. So what is it then, why is there such a great impact of COVID upon Black populations? And of course, we've all heard some of the factors that impact, such as respiratory problems, cardiovascular disease, of course, diabetes, obesity, and everything that you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't ask the question then why, because I've been saying throughout all of this that this is no surprise because the data is there, the research is there, the information is there that Blacks are disproportionately impacted by diseases that we now know make us more vulnerable to COVID. So it's not so much why as it is, talk a little about what you are seeing in this time of uh, COVID-19 with respect to cardiovascular disease, your yeah. area of specialty. So I, I love how you're framing it because um, I think that um, we already know that these disparities exist. Uh, what we wanna achieve is equity. Right, so we want to be solution oriented um, in approaching, you know, what the issues are. Uh, and I mentioned to you about how preventable some of these conditions are and manageable. Uh, one thing that I do want to throw in is something that we call the social determinants of health, which is who you are, where you live, what your resources are, what your access is. Um, education plays a role, um, you know, your socioeconomics play a role. And, and sometimes um, we see that these influences really impact um, how the disease or chronic condition 
plays out. We're fortunate in New York City in that um, you know, resources are available, but it's where people need to go to get them, right? So uh, pretty much um, when you look at, let's say hypertension or blood pressure, right? You gotta be educated about it. You gotta know that a lot of it has to do with what you put into your body, um, you know, the salt, um, making sure you get rest, making sure you're hydrated. And then there are resources like, um, you know, DASH, the dietary approach to um, managing hypertension. So, you know, knowing that you can go on site and actually do these preventative mechanisms, for instance, will also protect you against these other chronic conditions. So you ask sort of, so what's going on? Um, some of our, you know, uh, community, you know, residents, people we know, friends, family, whatever, um, they have other priorities sometimes that they are, you know, paying attention to and may leave behind managing their own health and their own bodies, not recognizing that if they're not up to par in terms of their health, all the other things are going to be here after they're gone, right? So they have to really focus along with some of the things that they're doing on, you know what, let me be the best me, the healthiest me that I can be. And let me take advantage of these resources and, um, and management skills. So I'm seeing a lot of people doing that now. And so if you have a well-controlled blood pressure, diabetes and weight, then you will do better if you do get infected with COVID, right? But if you have uncontrolled these, these um blood pressure is being totally out of control, your blood sugar, et cetera, um, your, your weight is out of control. Then on top of that, you get COVID, which is a virus, okay? It causes an inflammatory process that sets everything awry in your body. And then things continue to escalate. So then, you know, you may end up having um, a, a stroke or heart failure, heart attack, um, and your other organs will go into failure at the worst case scenario because they were already at a worst point to begin with, right? So uh, that's one of the reasons we're seeing sometimes when you know people of color do get infected, they do worse. But on the other hand, on the other side of it, I have patients who, if people look at them, they would say they shouldn't be alive. And we're talking about people who are 76, who just had a stent, who they have diabetes, hypertension, but because they have been uh, paying attention in terms of their body and doing things to build their immune system. Um, we've, I've had, or I recognize people who've had COVID who don't even need to go into the hospital. Why? Because they've built their immune system and they're taking steps to um, take care of themselves. So I think in the news, um, now of course, COVID is unpredictable. It's a coronavirus. So let me just tell you a few uh, points about it. It's a coronavirus. Corona means crown. Um, so it's a, it's a proteinaceous material core that's surrounded by this lipid layer and these spikes that allows it to bind with your cells and then overtake your body. So it has to be able to bind with the cells and then it gets into the cell and takes over the body and that's how it works. So if your cell is able to withstand um, having this virus take it over, that's with a high immune system, then the virus won't have much effect on you and you won't have much symptoms, right? So people who are pretty well, um, you know, um, taking care of themselves, et cetera, they would not have those symptoms. But it, what it does, once it goes in, it causes, besides disrupting everything, an inflammatory process, which then causes your body to release all kinds of cytokines and macrophages, um, and all of that. And that's what starts this cascade that makes people not well. So that's why that virus um, does the damage that it does. Um, similarly to the flu virus, which we get the vaccine for, but this one, it's the novel coronavirus. So we're not used to it. We don't know a lot of things about it yet. And it's really wreaking havoc on multiple organ systems within the body. And you talk a lot about what amounts to education, which we find even in our work that we are having to do over and over again with respect to whether it's HIV AIDS or whether it is hepatitis C, as well as the other, some of the other health uh, areas that I mentioned in terms of our work, that there's such a lack of 
information, even though we know information is available. Yes, yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. And I think sometimes the assumption is made that people go on the web or they go on the internet to find, but that simply is not true. So right. we have a lot to do continuing in terms of educating our communities about preventative measures, going to the doctor, and if not having access, how can we help to make sure that uh, laws are still in place, even though we now know that on a political level, there are efforts to dismantle even further the Affordable Care Act, so we cannot afford to let that happen. So you talk about education, you talk about prevention. Let me ask you a question about testing, because we continue to hear uh, recommendations from our elected representatives, especially, and medical professionals, to get tested, whether people have the symptoms or not. And we receive a lot of questions about that. So can you just speak about getting tested, whether people are experiencing the symptoms, should they consider being tested? What is your opinion on that? That's an excellent point. So um, just to segue a little bit, I, there's the program that I've been doing in Central Harlem since 2012. Um, we've had over 3,000, uh, you know, interactions or components with Central Harlem residents. Um, so we were reaching out to them during this point, uh, this uh, period. And one of the questions we asked were whether they got tested, right? And many people said they did not get tested. And when we asked what was the reason for not getting tested, they said they were afraid or they didn't know or they didn't want to go out. So one of the things... Um, is that people need to know what the testing entails, right? So there are two um, currently um, types of tests that we do. One is the antigen and one is the antibody. Antigen has to do with um, detecting the virus live as it's doing its damage. And that's when you're actively infected with the virus, okay? So that, that's when they do the swab down your nose or inside of your cheek. They need to get some material, some cells that may be already infected with the virus. And then they run like what we call a PCR analysis uh, to identify the virus itself or parts of the virus. So if parts of the virus breaks down, let's say you were already healed, but there's still pieces of the virus, then that test would be positive. Now there's a rate of um, false negativity and it depends on you know who's doing the testing and where it's coming from. So. Again, um, if you go to a reputable uh, place um, that you know that it's being done, because I understand all around the country, people are setting up sites and some of them are not reputable, but a reputable place would be say going to an urgent care, going to a hospital, going to a clinic, or um, you know, uh, maybe some different organizations have had it set up, uh, reputable organizations or your private doctor. So that's the swab that looks for and rules out an active infection. Now, remember that I said some people may be asymptomatic or they may have atypical symptoms and they don't know that. So there's the other test is called the antibody test. And the antibody test tells you that you have been exposed to the virus at some point. It, you're not any longer infected, but at some point along the way you were exposed. So it either means you had symptoms, you were sick or very sick or you're an asymptomatic carrier, but your body made antibodies to the, uh, you know, to that virus. So uh, when you do that, that's called the IgG antibody, and it tells you, it gives you uh, a, a sort of range of high, how high the antibodies are against the virus, and that's just a blood test. The issue with that is initially we uh, thought about if you have the antibodies, you have immunity to the virus. Because we don't know the virus very well, um, we don't know that you would be protected if you know you come across that virus again, which is why we tell people to continue to wear a mask, continue to act as if you've never had it, because even though you have a positive antibody, it doesn't mean that it's gonna protect you uh, from the virus if you come across it again. It just means that you were exposed to the virus. So I hope that answers your question. 
It does. And then you also raise the issue about wearing a mask because we're hearing a lot about that for different reasons. I don't want to wear a mask because I can't breathe. Or I don't want to wear a mask because I don't like how it looks on me. Or for some silly reasons. Um, I was uh, outside recently a couple of weeks ago and I saw this couple pass by. He had on his mask. She had on hers, but it was around the neck. And so I just said, well, why don't you have your mask on, you know, very friendly like, and she was very responsive. She said, because it's so hot and I do have asthma, but I put it on when I'm talking with people. So I told her gently, I said, well, I think especially since you say you have asthma and you're outside like this, I would suggest that while you're out, put it on, you know, very friendly. They were very receptive to it. But I see so many people, again, without them, not even under their chin, wearing masks. And so we have to do a little bit more education around that. So let me ask you in the few minutes that we have left to, to talk about a couple of things more. You talked about the messaging, how important it is that the right message in terms of whether we get tested or wearing masks in our community, what would you suggest as the right message? Right. That is so important. I think that is, is the caveat that we really need to have. So first of all, we've been receiving mixed messages from our leadership. Okay, let me just be very clear. Okay, if you have the virus inside of you and you cough, sneeze, um, shout, sing, um, and droplets get out, that virus is in those droplets. It gets into someone else's membranes, they will get infected. So the, the idea of wearing a mask is patriotic in one sense because it helps to prevent others from getting it if you have it, but it also helps you to keep your viruses in if you have it, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's stopping the spread, bottom line. And there are studies that show without the mask, um, it's 17.9% likely spread. That's the, uh, the, the mask will cut that down to three or so percent, okay? Some masks are more um, effective. The so-called N95 will reduce 95% of the pathogens. And then there are other masks, there are the cloth mask and the surgical mask, but whatever mask you wear will reduce the spread of droplets from your face to another. And so if someone else has it, it's not gonna be easily getting into you either. That's why it's mutually beneficial. So um, the idea is the bottom line is you wanna reduce the spread of the virus. So besides the mask, we talk about social distancing. If you are in a big crowd of people, someone may have it, and it's gonna be easily transmissible. When they've done the experiments, they show that droplets can travel up to six feet from one person, okay? That's where the six feet uh, thing comes in, all right? They've done these experiments. You're, just as I'm talking to you here, um, it, and this sounds gross, but my computer screen is about three feet from me, but let's say I had, if they were to color my droplets with some invisible sort of ink and then look at it, you're gonna see you know, spray, because that's what, when you speak, they're invisible or sometimes visible droplets that come out. So it's real science. So clearly if you wear a mask, it's gonna reduce those droplets. And clearly if you're far away, it's not gonna to get to you. That's the reason for the social distancing and for the mask. So that should be the clear message, okay? And the, and the other message I'm, I'm gonna say, because probably a lot of people who are already infected said, well, I don't have to wear a mask because I already got it and I'm not gonna get it again. We do not know if this virus is gonna mutate. We don't know enough about this virus so it can continue to change and you can get reinfected. And I give you the example of let's say the common cold or the flu. So even though you get a vaccine that, you know, sort of the virus kind of changes itself but replicates. Um, so that's why each year you need a different flu shot. So I would say to anyone who's already had COVID, don't feel secure that you can't get it again and that you can't spread it again. So continue to maintain the recommendations of social distancing and protecting or barrier methods, which in this case is the mask. And you may have gone into a lot of, um, to the banks or wherever and you see like a plastic 
something that separates. So that, again, that's a barrier method that again, keeps droplets from getting to the other person. I tell you, I can understand now why you called upon by so many people to share information with the wealth of knowledge and based on your experiences. So, so could you just share with your viewing audience how they might be able to be in touch with you, website information for sure. further uh, resources? Absolutely. Um, so I have a program that's called the Healthy Heart Series. So the website is www.healthyheartseries.org. And on there, you could find information, resources, um, managing your chronic conditions for the heart, a direct link to the CDC and other programs that we do. And see, Virginia, I've written um, some books for, um, because you know we talk on these venues and we're talking to adults, but a lot of young people are spreading the virus. They may be asymptomatic, they bring it to others. And so I've written some booklets. They were actually intended for when the kids were out of school. It talks all about the virus and it has interactions. I wrote this book, plus I wrote a coloring book that basically is designed for black and brown uh, individuals. That's my little picture right there. But um, it has, you know, um, like lots of activities and it's a coloring book for kids to do, you know, um, when, um, you know, uh, and you could read as a family as well. So um, these are available if people reach out to me. Um, a suggested donation of uh, $10 for this big one and a suggest suggested donation of $5 for this. Um, so can they get information about the books on your website also? They would be able to reach out to me and find out how to get the books from the website, yes. So I think that's very interesting yeah. because uh, uh, I have the, the younger people in my family or nieces and nephews and we're talking a lot. And when you put up the color book, I said, wow, that's the next deal. Well, Dr. Fergus, this has been so exciting. And you have just provided a wealth of information that I know our viewers will be most interested in. And the fact that you share the, your website and information allows them to be in touch further. So I want to thank you for uh, this information. And of course, the information on my organization, you may visit our website, ndlch.org, and also look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. The Manhattan Neighborhood Network brings these programs to you to better inform you, the viewer, about the important topics that impact your health and well being. So please let your family, friends, and neighbors know about this program and especially about the discussion today cardiovascular disease and its impact on COVID. 19 impact on our hearts. And I am C. Virginia Fields, and I thank you for joining us and hope you'll tune in next time for Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.